Ephesians chapter 4 is an interesting statement. The second half of the chapter is an interesting statement about the before and after of being a Christian. About what it is to know Christ. You remember that in Galatians 2 verse 20, Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. In verse 20 of Ephesians chapter 4, Paul says, but you did not learn Christ in this way. I am a person who spends a lot of time, and my profession requires me to spend a certain amount of time with words, and how words are used, and what they mean. And I find this use of words in verse 20 extremely interesting. But you did not learn Christ in this way. It seems like a lot of different ways he could have said it. He could have said, you did not learn to follow Christ in this way. You did not learn Christianity in this way. You did not learn religion in this way. You did not learn faith in this way. But what he says is you did not learn Christ in this way. Christ is a person. And yet Paul uses Christ to refer to everything that it is to be a father. Everything that it is to be a Christian. And so I want us to talk about that for a few minutes tonight. What we did not learn about Christ and what it is to be in Christ. And what we should have learned or what we are supposed to learn or how we're supposed to learn Christ. Let's start with a negative first in verse 17. So this I say, and affirm together with the Lord, that you walk no longer, just as the Gentiles also walk, in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, have, and they having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way. Christ is the opposite of those things. And when we learn Christ, when we have learned Christ, we do not live in that way. We no longer walk in that way. But notice exactly what that anti-Christ walk is. That not Christ walk. The futility of their mind. Verse 17. You know what futility means, right? Useless. Have you ever seen a person plan and scheme and go to all this effort and all of these Links to try to accomplish something that was completely useless. I see people do that. I see people worrying about things that has no power over them one way or another. If they're able to affect the outcome, it won't help them a bit. If they're unable to affect the outcome, it won't hurt them a bit. Sometimes I think of the roadrunner and Wild E. Coyote and all the things that he did and all the schemes that he came up with to catch the roadrunner. If he did catch him, he couldn't keep him once he caught him. It's futility. It's useless effort. A lot of people's minds and energies and creativities and anxieties are spent in futility. Worrying about things Trying to obtain things that are useless. If you have all the money in the world, it will not protect you from illness, disease, accident. And yet almost everybody we know is 
is spending almost all of their energy trying to get money. If you get power, if you get great power, if you become the leader of a country, it won't protect you from those things either. Hugo Chavez, the president of Venezuela, is apparently in critical condition in a hospital in Cuba right now. And all of his power doesn't keep him from succumbing to whatever illness he may have. He may not succumb to it, but if he doesn't, it won't be because he's powerful. We chase power. We chase influence. But in the most important contexts, it's not useful. It's futile. But we don't understand that when we walk as the rest of the world walks, when we live like everybody else lives, when we think like everybody else thinks. Verse 18, darkened in their understanding. That's why they're living in a futility of mind, because they don't understand what's truly important. They don't understand that it's the eternal that's most important. They don't understand that it's what happens after death, not before your death, or the time of your death that's most important. And so many other things that we didn't understand when we lived like everybody else, when we walked like everybody else. But notice the effect of that. Excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Excluded from the life that God has prepared for you. Excluded from the wonderful fountain of blessings that God has in store for you. Excluded from the life of God. With a hard heart. Having become callous, he says in verse 19. Your heart has been so abused and so mistreated. You've treated your heart, you've treated the core of your being like it didn't really matter what happened to it. People treat the core of their being like it doesn't matter what they expose it to. And it gets hard. It gets callous. And they become insensitive to truth. They become insensitive to to the pain they inflict on other people. And they are excluded from the life of God because of the hardness, the callous nature of their heart. And what does that wind up putting them into at the end of verse 19? Having given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. Sensuality, lust, a desire to satisfy the flesh because the flesh is the only source of pleasure I ever achieve. If that's your life, if the only source of pleasure you ever achieve is physical, bodily pleasure, you're missing most of the best parts of life. If you don't uh, realize and benefit from the pleasure of of love, of service, of kindness, of fellowship, of knowing other people and being known and being safe and secure even while being known by other people, you're missing most of the best parts of life. And that's exactly what these people are experiencing and they give themselves over to sensuality with all types of impurity and greed. Do you see people who are greedy sometimes? <coughs> I don't know if I'm extra sensitive when I'm in airports, but I've been in an airport more this year than I usually spend in airports. I usually maybe fly once a year, oftentimes less frequently than that. But this year I have flown at least three or four times. And I notice people who are more than willing to elbow in front of other people. More than willing to take what another person wants. More than willing to put another person out to get a little bit of extra elbow room or a little bit of extra foot space. 
You get on the airplane and sometimes people get on before they're supposed to and they put their bag in the overhead bin, 10 rows ahead of their own so that they can get it on the way out, not even caring about the person who's going to sit up there and not have anywhere to put their bag when they're going when they're supposed to. Greed is not only about money. But it's about what I can get, what can get me out quicker, what can make my life a tad bit easier at anybody's expense. But you did not learn Christ in this way. That's not how Jesus acted. It's not how Jesus treated people. It's not how Jesus looked at other people. And it's not how people who have learned Christ treat people and look at situations. Let's look at the positive. Verse 21. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus. Notice he says that this is a deal breaker. He says, but you did not learn Christ in this way. If you have heard him and been taught in him, because truth is in it. He's saying, this is the only way. In Christ, what I'm telling you now is universal. If you've learned Christ, if you've been taught in Christ, and if you have heard Christ, you're going to know this. Because this is true. And in Christ, this is universal truth. It's always this way. What's always this way? Verse 22, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your body, and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Now notice the references there in verse 22, the former manner of life, which he's already described in 17, 18, and 19 which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. Lay that aside. Stop thinking like you used to think. Stop looking at the world through the lenses and the prisms that the world would put in front of your eyes. And allow Christ to take away that ignorance, to take away those filters, to take away those selfish goggles. And look at it from a new perspective. Notice what he says here. He talks about the new self, verse 24. Put on the new self, verse 23, renewed in the spirit of your mind, created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. The Bible, the New Testament, talks about this idea over and over and over again. This idea of transformation, recreation, New self versus old self. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2 talks about that. I, I beseech you, brethren, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spirit, so that you may prove that which is acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world like those, everybody else, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is. That which is good and acceptable. I messed up that quote. I apologize for that. But it's that idea. Jesus said, unless you were born again, you could by no means enter the kingdom of God. John 3, when he was talking to Nicodemus. Renewal, transformation, rebirth, new self. That's how we need to look at ourselves. That's how we need to see ourselves. Either as formerly having been in need of rebirth, recreation, or currently in need of rebirth and recreation. But if formerly in need of it, and now having been reborn, then being reminded that we've been reborn, that we've been changed, that we've been transformed into something different, and that we're supposed to be different, we're supposed to stand out, we're supposed to look at things different. We're supposed to learn our mindset from the truth of God and not from the world around. 